Let's pray together. Lord God, thank you so much for who you are. There are voices in this world that would tell us that we are nothing and that, that we're not important and that we're rubbish, that we don't belong. But the only voice that matters, Lord, is yours. So this time we pray that we would hear your voice speaking your love into our hearts, that, that you would uh, encounter us in the midst of our hopelessness and speak the truth of your hope and your goodness and your, your peace that passes all understanding. It's a peace that can overcome any turbulence or any trauma, any difficulty in life. So God, may we live in that peace and experience it and, and not by anything that we could do, but only as a result of your goodness and your grace and your mercy. We praise you, God, for all that you've done and, and, and thank you for all that you're about to do. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen. Please have a seat. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to see you, Jason and King David and Teddy on the drums and Mia singing out and Ben. We got to love this band. We don't have a name for the band, right? Because like Theater 3 used to be the name for the band because we used to meet in a movie theater. That was the beginning of Highlands Church. And now we, we're, we need a new name for the band. So I think we got to work on that one. Uh, yes, put, your comic card. put it on your comic card. Let's do it. Let's start today. It's first service. No, we didn't ask anybody else for this. We, this service, you guys get to name the band. How's that? So, so put it on the comment card. Uh, you probably won't be able to think of anything else for the rest of the service. Uh, um, but this is a good, good thing to think about. New beginnings, new things that are happening here. Um, one of the uh, awesome new things that is happening is there's, uh, there's a football game later today. Is that kind of good? Anybody excited about that? Who was more excited about the game yesterday? Who was more excited about... Who's more excited just about the, the room that's surrounded by chips? Just like you just walked in and you realize I, this is, this is an exercise in temptation, just surrounded by chips and salsa. That's the whole room today. You know, I asked my son, I said, so what is the greatest thing that you have learned, right? What's the greatest thing you learned? I asked him that. Uh, and he said, um, I learned that tigers eat leaves. And I said, I didn't tell him that they don't eat leaves, but maybe they do. He watches a lot of nature specials. But then I said, no, really, what's the greatest thing that you learned? And he thought about it for a second. He said, you know... A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y. I said, that is probably a pretty big thing to have learned. That's a good beginning. That's a great place to start. In fact, uh, there's a theologian that said that the greatest thing that you can ever say or know about God is the simplest thing that you learn when you're a little kid. That he had written all these books and all of these, you know, like um, big fat books about Jesus and the Bible. And he said, it all sums up in these few words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Just simple. That's it. There's nothing else. You don't need more than that in life. And so that's what, that's what one guy said is the big thing that he learned. But I want to ask you the question, what have you learned? What is the big like, like revelation, meaning like that big eye-opening experience that you had in your life? And, and do you remember when it happened and, and how it happened, who was there, uh, what that experience was like? I know that a lot of people have that eye-opening experience when they're at the lowest point of their life, when things are the toughest. And that's when we tend to reach out and we, we recognize that we don't have what it takes, so we start to ask for help. So this series is about beginnings, and I want to look at a story uh, of, uh, of, of a beginning in the church. It was an early church, a new church, that Paul wrote a letter to called the Church in Ephesus. What a great name for a church, right? The Church in Ephesus. People ask why we're called Highlands Church. It's because we're in the Highlands Plaza. That's why we're called the Highlands Church. I mean, it's the easiest way to find us, right? That's not, not, a, big, not a big confusing thing. <clears throat> Same thing with the church in Ephesus. Churches back then were just named based on their location, so you could find them. And so um, this is what the words that Paul wrote to this church. And he starts out with a really great intro. At one time, you were like a dead person. That's a great way to start a letter, if you ask me. I mean, like, I've written a lot. I, I write thank you cards to people, but I rarely start out with the words, at one time, you were like a dead person. Oh, thank you. Um, because, now, that, see, he says this. At one time, you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and your offenses against God. Now, I'll tell you, one of the things that I learned uh, years ago when I was driving is uh, if your phone rings and it's in your pocket, don't answer it. I pulled my foot off of the gas, reached in for my phone, and hit the back of that car. Man, that hurt my neck, and man, I probably shouldn't be here today based on that. Uh, have you had some hard lessons that you've learned in your life? Like things like that where you go, you know, that's kind of a no-brainer. Don't answer your phone. Don't take your foot off the gas. Those kind of things. Don't text and drive. Those are things that you kind of go, okay, I, I hope I can learn. Now, 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 Paul is actually doing, conjuring up a different image. He says, at one point, you were like a dead person because of the things you did wrong and the offenses against God. You used to live like the people of this world. You followed the rule of a destructive spiritual power. This is the spirit of disobedience 
to God's will that is now at work in persons whose lives are characterized by disobedience. Sometimes I feel like I need to uh, just tell my kids, you know, your life is characterized by disobedience. Just want to tell you that. Or actually my puppy, my puppy needs to hear that. My puppy's life is characterized by disobedience right now. It's like all of our lives as children. It goes on to say, at one time you were like those persons. Uh, So you were like a child. And all of you used to do whatever you felt good, whatever, whatever you thought you wanted, so that you were children. There he goes. He throws it in there. He says, you were little babies, right? This is like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Hey, baby. You know, like the, uh, remember? You're such a baby. Um, you know, he's saying, so that you were, he did. Paul would write these letters. He's like, you guys are a bunch of babies, little babies. Try to grow up. Look through it. You'll see it's there. <clears throat> you wanted so that you were children headed for punishment just like everyone else. So I, th- I think the image that, that's a good one is, is, well, of course, children headed for punish- punishment. How many times do you have to tell a kid not to touch the flame, right? How many times? Well, guess what? The best way to, for a kid to learn not to touch the flame, touch the flame. They always do it. Everybody does at some point in their life. And so, so this is the, the image that I think is a good one for us in our life. Imagine a speedboat heading across a, a beautiful glassy lake. A- and what, what happens behind the, the, the speedboat? The, what's that called? It's the wake, right? Yeah, so if you're like a canoeist, you know, uh, if the, avid canoeist, like most of you probably are, um, and you're sitting on that Lake Nassimeno and someone comes by with that speedboat right up against your canoe, what's going to happen? It's going to knock you over. Or if, or if, or if you're uh, out there scuba diving, you're just like, hey, you know, I want to see the, all of the exotic creatures in Lake Nassimeno, right? <laughs> I don't know. But you have that little, that, you have that little um, floaty up there to tell people to stay away, but guess what? It just goes right over that and can hurt you, right? And so you can think of all the things that can happen as a result of someone who's going forward full force with their speedboat in life, trying to, trying to just do what they feel good, and, and they don't recognize that behind them is there's this wake of destruction. And, and I feel like that's what Paul wants us to remember, that a lot of times we do what we want, we're pursuing the things we want, but in, in the behind us, we're not conscious that, that there's families being torn apart, there's people who are, who are being destroyed, heart heartbreak is happening as a result of the things that we've done to people. Um, the ways in which people have been abandoned or left, left to live in the river because we haven't stepped out and, and done things to reach out and help them. Or people who are in prison that don't have anyone to visit them uh, or in the hospital. And so we, we have this wake of destruction because we're doing what we want to do only, right? Because we're just following our guts. We're, we're, we're going after these things. Now, the scripture does not leave you there. It wants you to remember that that's where you used to be. And it says these words. It says, but now, I believe it says, but now, let's see. Yep, however, <laughs> it depends on who, which Greek translation you're reading anyway. <laughs> however, God is rich in mercy. God is rich in mercy. He brought us to life with Christ while we were dead as a result of those things that we did wrong. Wait a second. While we were dead, he brought us back to life again. He did this because of the great love he has for us. Is this the first time that you're hearing... In hearing in your life straight from the Bible that says God has a great love for you? I mean, do you have a hard time sometimes wrapping your mind around that? I, I know that sometimes in life you, re- you run into a person and they say, I love you. And then you go, hmm, we'll see. And, and you're right, and, and then they, I love you. And then uh, maybe, maybe the hundredth time you hear, you hear someone say, I love you, and you go, maybe they really do love me. Maybe they really do love me. You know, this is God saying directly through the Bible that he loves you. And you are saved by God's grace. If you're going to underline anything in your Bible today, it's those words, you are saved by God's grace. That's it. You're not saved by your own doing or anything else. A lot of times I feel like we get into this place where we feel like we're the ones who have saved ourselves. That we've kind of, we've kind of, we've got life all figured out. That we've just climbed this ladder, you know, we can get ourselves out of the pit or out of the tough situations that we've gotten ourselves into. But we can't. We just can't. I think the image that Paul wants you to have in your head is one of you standing, or standing over your own dead body as a young person. Just imagine that image of yourself standing over that body and just recognizing that, that you were dead. That's what Paul says. Paul says, at one point, you were dead. That's it. Now, I don't know about you, but when you're dead, there's not a lot you can do to get yourself out of that situation, right? You're kind of stuck. That's game over. There's nothing left to do. But then the Bible says, that Jesus, by God's grace, brought you back to life again, resuscitated you, brought you back up on your feet and gave you a new lease on life. Man, I love that image. And, and you know, 
One of my favorite people in uh, church history, by the way, church history is so exciting. I'm going to just talk to him. <laughs> just kidding. It is exciting. This guy's name is Martin Luther. I think his friends probably called him Marty, you know? I don't know, but he was alive 500 years ago. He's, his dad was poor uh, growing up, but he had done some good business in his life, and he became a copper mine owner. And so his dad said, hey, you know what, you're not going to, you know that normal story, we hear it all the time, you know, I don't want you to live with the hardships I had in my life. So he said to his son, you're going to go to law school, right? You're going to become a lawyer. Isn't that like the, the kind of myopic vision of what like a success looks like in life? Uh, law school, you're going to go to law school. So, so Marty, Marty goes through all the school, he gets into his first, he gets into his first month of law school, maybe second month of law school, and he drops out. He drops out and he doesn't fulfill his dad's dreams for him. Instead, he goes and he becomes part of a monastery. He becomes a monk. Can you imagine that dad getting that letter? Dear dad, thanks for all of the hundreds of thousands of dollars you spent on my education. I decided to become a monk. What? All right. So, so he becomes a monk. And in the early days of his monasticism, Marty has this troubling sensation that he can't get over sin. Like sin is something he's not beating, but he's determined. So what he decides to do is that he's going to, uh, he's going to develop practices, spiritual practices. He must have had, can you imagine the medieval book of spiritual practices? <laughs> can you imagine like, <laughs> we should try to bring that one back. That sounds fun, right? That'll be our next sermon series, the medieval, medieval spiritual practices. So this is the list of spiritual practices that he went through when he was trying to get, get over his sin in life. The first one was uh, flagellation. Oh, no, 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 not flagellation. Sorry, that's something else. <laughs> that's if you eat too many beans. Okay, so I, what is it? <laughs> Actually, flagellation, flagell that's flagellation. Flagellation is when you take a whip, right? You take a whip and you beat yourself with it, right? It would be like equivalent to someone who suffers from cutting, you know, people who feel like, oh, I'm a terrible person or, or they just want to experience pain, that kind of thing. He, had, he suffered from a lot of that. So he beat himself with, with whips. And he said, maybe if I can identify with the time when Jesus was beat with whips, when he was, when he was scourged and, and in the story of Jesus, he had little pieces of glass and stone that was attached to the end to like rip, the back, rip, rip his back into shreds. So Marty, Marty would have like said, okay, I need to experience that. And so he would have done this, and, 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 and then guess what? He would, he would punish himself for the sin he did because he said, if I get a severe enough punishment, then I won't do it again, right? And guess what happened? He sinned again. Oh, no, that didn't work. So he came up with another one. He found a new idea. He was going to sleep in the snow. So he waited until it snowed a lot, and he laid down in the snow, and he laid out there until he couldn't even get himself inside. His friends had to pick him up in the middle of the night and carry him in, back into his room. Another time he came up with the idea of how to, how to kick sin. He's going to get over sin in his life. This is going to be the one time he's going to finally become, you know the book, the modern day book called The Me I Always Wanted to Be, right? This is like, this is Marty, early days, Martin Luther could have written this book himself. The Me I Always Wanted to Be. He decided that if he slept in his, in his stone floor without a bed and without any sheets. He got rid of all of the blankets that somehow maybe that would just, just be enough punishment, enough discipline that he could kick sin. Do you think it worked? Never. Didn't work at all. And so he would, uh, the stories about young Marty inside of his, 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 his like, kind of like a cell, his room, is that he would yell at night and wrestle with God and he would scream out. And suddenly the supervisor's like, hey, buddy, you're taking this a little bit seriously, right? <laughs> like, like the monks were getting sick of him. <laughs> like, we know this is a discipline and all, but can you just slow it down? You're making all the rest of us look like, you know, weak or something. And so... So what, so what Marty hears his supervisor say one day is, you know what, you need to get outside of your headspace. You just got to get outside of here. Have you ever find that you do that in your life? You get inside your head? You know, like if you watch the football games later today, do you know why the team that loses is going to lose? Because their head. Because they're going to be psyching themselves out. Have you heard that term before? Have you ever been in that moment? I, I'm convinced that I would have been like a streak three-point sh shooter for the whole of my life, except for psych. I know how to shoot a three-pointer. I, I do. But every time I get up there, it's just like, oh, I'm going to miss. And I just throw it out like that, right? We psych ourselves out. We know how to do these things. But something happens up here. And so the supervisor says, okay, Marty, look, you got to get out of, your, out of your space. And he says, okay, we have an idea. You should go and hang out with college students. 
you know, college students full of life, and you should go and, and, um, and you should go just you could teach them. And why don't you teach them these two new classes that need, they need a professor for Psalms, the book of Psalms, and for Romans. So he goes down to this university in Wittenberg, Germany, and he starts teaching on Psalms and Romans. But as he teaches them, guess what happens? He learns. I'm teaching a class at the end of this month. It's like the first class, I think, feel like that I'm teaching here since, uh, since I've been here as a pastor. Um, and, uh, and I feel like it's a great thing whenever I get to teach a class because I get, it, I get drawn outside of myself. I get to do something new. I love teaching. It's one of my favorite things in the world. And, and so, um, so, so they said, go and teach this class. And as he's teaching, he learns about God's grace in a new way. He starts to hear about this thing called God's grace. And he thinks, you know, wait a second. If I keep trying to kick sin, what does it mean for the sacrifice that Christ made? He reads that in the book of Romans. Then one night he has a dream. And in his dream, he sees himself dead. He sees his own dead body as a young man. And, that, and when he wakes up from that dream, he goes to this really sacred place at the monastery called the tower, which is the other word that they used for the toilet at the monastery. They called it the tower, right? And while he's on the toilet, I'm not kidding you, in that moment, his eyes were opened and he discovered the grace of God. The biggest thought in all of like Christian history, probably the past 500 years was had right there in the tower. Talk about a place where you're going to discover your humanity, right? Where you're going to discover that there's nothing glamorous about what it means to be a human being. My kids have a book that had a book when they were a little kid. Do you know the book I'm talking about? It's called Everybody. You all know the book. Yeah. Everybody poops. That's right. <laughs> Every time I preach this, the attendance just goes down the next Sunday. <laughs> it's true. It's really funny. I, I was every beginning of every new year. I don't know why. But it all starts there, doesn't it? It all starts there because it's when we recognize our depravity, our humanity, that, that, that we are refuse, that we are nothing, that we just can't make it out of there and that we end up in our own, we can't get out of the tower, right? Can't get out of the tower. But what God does is God, God comes into our life. I think, about, I think about people who are trying to achieve salvation. You know, it's almost comical to think about the early fishermen on the Sea of Galilee trying to achieve salvation. And then what happens they, they, they hear a voice that says, hey, come follow me. They turn, and who is it? It's Jesus. And they follow Jesus. See, you just, there's no encountering Jesus without Jesus first encountering us. It doesn't happen that way. See, if we, we keep thinking that we're going to somehow achieve salvation and work our way to salvation like we're climbing a ladder. That's what Marty discovered. That's what Martin Luther discovered. You can't climb your way out of the pit. You need Jesus to lift you up and bring you into his presence. I love, uh, I love how this scripture continues because clearly in the early days of the church, they needed to hear it in the church in Ephesus, didn't they? They needed to hear it. We all need to hear it over and over and over again. It said these words, and God raised us up and seated us in the heavens with Christ Jesus. Did you know that you're seated in the heavens with Jesus? Well, last week we had communion. We had bread here on the table. We got to break bread with one another. You're seated with Jesus. Around the room are all these different groups that you can be a part of. We're going to take a minute and a in a minute, we're going to take a break and everybody's going to have an opportunity to, to, to contemplate and pray over the groups and encourage the leaders and try the spicy salsas, right? And ask them, are you going to have cake at yours? Because I'm looking for a group that has cake, right? Because I know I'm depraved. I'm, I'm just being real. And in those opportunities, you're going to have a chance to break bread with Jesus. Do you know what the church is called? It's called the body of Jesus. And Jesus Christ is the head. And, and the, the actual people in the church are referred to in the Bible as the members of the body. Like, I don't know about you, but I, I feel like I'm a pinky maybe, you know? I don't know about pinkies. Pinkies, you know, when you drink a glass, they're just the one that goes, oh, I'm kind of fancy, you know? Right? But you imagine a pinky saying, hey, you know what? I can fulfill my purpose over here. I don't need the body. That wouldn't be a very useful pinky, would it? See, the pinky needs the body as much as the body kind of needs the pinky. But every, every part of the body is important. And, and so when you are engaged with fellowship with other people, when you're engaged in 
times of small group, then you are transformed. Because you are allowing yourself to experience what it's like to, to be seated in the heavens with Jesus Christ. You know, I think a lot of people think, hey, you know, I can, I can work my way out of this. I, I got a plan. It's going to be the same plan as last year. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to go home. I'm going to wake up. I'm going to go to work. Maybe go to the gym or the store or the ice cream store, whatever. And then I'm going to come back home again. And I'm going to talk to the same 10 people over and over again about the same 10 things for the next 50 years of my life, right? But Einstein said the definition of ins insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, Right? But then there's this opportunity for you to break the pattern and to engage in an, in an experience of community with other people. And you know, I always find it interesting because I run into a lot of people that say, you know, I really don't think I'm going to learn a lot uh, in that small group experience. And first of all, my favorite thing to point out is, oh, I'm sorry you thought it was about you. <laughs> no, I don't say that. that was, that's why not a lot of people are in small groups, honestly. Um, actually, the best small groups are full of people who are not about themselves. They say, you know what? I think I can go teach something. And, and the best way I can teach is not by talking, but by listening. And so they go into those experiences thinking, you know, I'm going there for someone else today. Just like Martin Luther was going to that university so he could teach those kids, right? But he got schooled. And he got brought back to life in a new way. And we confuse ourselves if we think that, you know, hey, you know, if we don't, go to a small group, should beat ourselves up. Somehow the small group is the, is the way out. No. Jesus, that's all you need, Jesus. All you need is this, I, the, the, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tell me so. See, I think that one of the biggest things that I struggle with, and I don't know about you, get, is I get things backwards. I do things the wrong way, right? I, 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 I put the cart before the horse, which is always fun because, you know, the horse then has, is trying to push this cart, you know. Uh, we should try that someday, just at Highlands. Anybody have a horse? You have a horse? You have a cart? Let's do it. You put the cart before the horse, it doesn't work. Not that well. I feel like sometimes I feel like, okay, oh, I really want to experience a full life right? Uh, so I'm going to do great things, and then I'll experience this fullness in Jesus Christ. Instead of turning to Jesus Christ and recognizing that the great things are an outflow of that. They don't happen, as, they don't happen because, you don't encounter Jesus Christ because you climb yourself out of a pit. You don't encounter Jesus Christ because you do this or this or this and not this and not that. In fact, Jesus Christ encounters you, and as a result, great things happen in your life. You end up in these dream centers or these think tanks talking and dreaming about how you guys can, can work together to change the world in a radical new way. It goes on to say these words. God did this to show, us, show future generations the greatness of his grace by the goodness that has, God has shown us in Christ Jesus. Here it is again. He says it again. You are saved by God's grace because of your faith. Where does faith come from? From God. This salvation is God's gift. It's not something you possessed. Imagine like a UPS package that arrived on your doorstep. That's what it is. All you have to do is open the door and bring it on in, right? You say, oh, wow, that's too much work. Really? God just literally delivered this package on your doorstep. Your job is to bring it inside, open it up, and receive it. It's the love of Jesus. So it's not something that you possessed and now you have it. It's not something you did that you can be proud of. So don't ever look at someone else and say, hey, you know what? I want to tell you, I, I feel pretty proud about this. I have faith in Jesus Christ, and this is because of what I did. Mm -mm, it's not. It's really not. The fact that each one of us is here is a miracle. Instead, we are God's accomplishment. Isn't that great? God's accomplishment. Don't take credit for this one. Created in Christ to do good things. God planned for these good things to be the way that we live our lives. What you and, you and I encounter in Jesus is, is purely a gift. That's it. It's just something that's given to us. And, and, and all we have to do is bring it on inside. All we have to do is welcome it into our lives and allow, uh, allow Jesus to do the great work. But the result is, that good things end up happening in our lives. Now, will we ever kick sin? Mm -mm. We won't. We won't. Will we always hate sin? Yes. 
Will we hate being a part of those things that are leaving a wake of destruction behind us? And will we always look and say, gosh, there I did it again. But to live in grace is such a beautiful thing. It's, such a, it's a wonderful experience in life that, that actually Martin Luther became one of the happiest people that you'd ever meet in your life. He wrote songs, more songs. And do you know what he based all of his songs on? Drinking songs. <laughs> They're like, oh, la, 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 think about it. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. All that joy that he brought. That's what Martin Luther, he was one of the greatest composers. He was one of, the, one, of the, one of the most fun people to be around. And because there was that shift, that moment where he, he was, he, he he had this experience, this discovery. And so I don't want you to think about like, hey, you know what? How can I get to this place of grace? You can't. My prayer is that just today, maybe this is the first time that you're hearing about it, just like it was for Martin Luther. Like today is this moment when you're just like, oh, grace, okay, I think I get that. That's something I want to be a part of. That, that I understand it. It's just a truth. You, you, can't, you can't say yes or no to the truth. It's just the truth that God loves you even when you're dead. And that the reason that you're here today is because of God's grace. You know, my favorite thing uh, at the end of this month is not just going to be the people in this room who say, you know what, I do want to be baptized for the first time. It's not just the people in this room who are just going to say, you know what, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I feel like I, I, want to make a, I, I want to make a statement about God's grace in my life. Or I want to actually for the first time in my life say, you know what, I'm a follower of Jesus. If you want to, if you want to say, hey, those Christians or those Christ followers, you can count me as one from here on out. As that is a great moment, and the baptisms we'll have out there are so awesome, but I love at the end of each one of the services when we have the baptisms and professions of faith. And you know what song we sing? Amazing Grace. For me, I feel like you could sum up all of the, the truth of God's love in that simple song, in the first line of that song, when we all hold hands and, and we sing, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, you know it, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that you have come into this world to call us by name, that you have come into this, this space of our brokenness, into, our, into, the, into the towers even of our life, and you say, you know what, you are loved. There is nothing that you can separate you from, from my love. And so we hear that word that you speak, God, and, and we celebrate it. We pray, God, that today there would just be an awakening in, in the heart of every person here, awakening to your grace, uh, a remembrance of who you are, and a celebration that, that, that yes, we will always struggle, that, that we, were always, we are always um, wrestling with the realities of this world, but Lord Jesus, you have seated us at your table, and that our, our job is literally to celebrate and to welcome others into this experience of joy and fun and um, community as you intended us to live. We praise you, God, and pray this in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, amen. amen.